everybody for coming out. I'm David Chandler, uh, Android developer advocate with Google, and I've been with Google about two years. I'm based in Atlanta. But tonight, I just wanted to give you a, a little preview of a simple template-based object relational mapping tool. To be truthful, I came up with the name Storm because I thought it was cool, and then I figured out what S and T stood for. <laughs> so, but but that's what it is. Um, so. We try to write a lot of code on the uh, Android developer relations team. And I'm fairly new to the team. I came in January. So one of the first things that I noticed when I started doing Android uh, development was I said, well, I want to persist stuff to the database on the phone. It's really cool that it has SQLite. And uh, I'm like, uh, so you know, where's, my, where's my ORM? Because I'm used to having something like Hibernate on the server that makes it real easy to do that. And, uh, there, were, there are a few ORMs out there, uh, but I wasn't completely satisfied with what was there, so I decided to write one. Um, besides, I needed a, something to do for the last month. You know. <laughs> anyway, so that's what I'm showing you tonight. This is kind of a, I'm calling it a preview, uh, because we're, as a team, we're interested in constantly in improving the state of Android tooling and in making it easier for uh, developers to write their first Android app uh, or any Android app. So we are trying to uh, beef up the ADT and the Android developer tools. And you've probably seen in the last month or so, we've come out with application templates, and we're continuing to add more of those for, for new types of apps. Uh, and we also have a way now for you to create your own templates. Um, we're talking about adding a hook for annotation processing, which is something that this uh, software uses, uh, so that if you have an Android library, um, that comes through like the official uh, download manager, then you could have that run an annotation processor automatically or configure it in Eclipse automatically, something like that. Uh, so that, that should hopefully uh, increase the, the scope of, of tooling and, and in, I guess some things that are possible there. So I want to spend like the first uh, part of tonight talking about Storm, and then we'll get to this, the second part. If I have a few minutes left, I'll talk on uh, Basic HTTP Client, which is another open source project I did for Android. So how many, I assume everybody here is an Android developer. Is that true? You, like you've written Hello World, whatever? OK. So those of you who haven't, uh, I'm not going to try to do any Android 101 stuff tonight. We're just going to jump right into what this thing is. Uh, but at a high level, SQLite is a SQL database that's on the phone. And uh, you can use it in your apps. Um, the APIs that are there are pretty low level. So when you want to use a database, you have to write your create table statements. Um, you have to pretty much hand code all your SQL. There's a few convenience methods that let you use objects like content values uh, to do an insert. Um, but some way or another, you're going to have to take the contents of any Java objects that you have. I'm going to call them POJOs tonight, your plain old Java object, and call the various bind methods or convert them to strings and pass them as arguments, or somehow you know, get them to be part of a SQL statement that does an insert, a query, an uh, update, whatever it may be. Right, so what I'm going to show you tonight is really just a little bit of tooling that, that writes that code for you. And uh, what is really a very efficient way. Right? So let me jump to the next slide. Uh, so nobody likes to hand code SQL. Well, maybe some people do. Actually, I know some people do. <laughs> I take that back. Any DBAs in the room who love to hand code SQL? Uh, SQLite already has some object-like wrappers. The content values objects, there's uh, in the database, uh, I think it's database utils, there's uh, an insert method that takes a content values object. So it's just essentially a map uh, of, of properties. And then on the other side, you have your, your cursor object, which you can call one row at a time and call the various get methods, like get short, get long, get int, uh, for the appropriate field type and then uh, get a property out of the cursor. So these are, these are kind of object-like, but what I'd really like to be able to do is actually you know, have a DAO class, a data access object, maybe server-side terminology, um, and just do a DAO.insert and give it my actual Java object and have it figure out how to get that into the, the SQL. Right? So that's what this does. Uh, so a lot of apps just require a place to, 
to stuff objects. Right? They, don't, they don't need the full relational power of the database. You might not need referential integrity and all that. In fact, it's not even enabled by default in your, uh, in your Android apps. Um, and then existing uh, ORMs I mentioned earlier tend to use reflection, um, which isn't a big deal in Java nowadays. Um, but it does make your code a little harder to debug if you're trying to figure out what's going on deep down in the internals. Uh, or they require upfront modeling, like green DAO. So I have to ask, are the authors of these projects here? Because this is San Francisco, where a lot of this stuff happens. We've been using green DAO for a while. You've been using green DAO for a while? OK. We use like a customized version. Use what? We're using a customized version of green DAO. Using a customized version. OK, cool. So, from what I've looked at Greendale, and I haven't looked a lot, but you, you have to create your schema first and uh, set up, you know, it's modeling, basically. Um, so what I was looking for was something that was really easy and embraced all the latest fads, like convention over configuration, uh, was annotation driven. Uh, we'll do code generation so you can debug it easier and also We'll leave that alone for now. Uh, well, it's, it's performant as well. Um, and then has minimal performance overhead. So the, the generated code that you're going to look at is going to be almost identical to the code that you would write by hand. Um, the only step that's different is the, convert, the different type conversions. There may be a little overhead there. But for the most part, it's what you'd write by hand. OK, some non-goals of the project. At Google, all of our projects have goals and non-goals. I think it's kind of cool right? that we actually think about that. So it is not intended to be a kitchen sink ORM. Uh, there are no relationship modeling capabilities right now. Um, it's really intended to be just a convenience for stuffing objects in your app into the database as a persistent store. Another non-goal is the absolute maximum performance possible. Uh, so I'm OK with a little overhead if it makes the generated code easier to read and write. Um, you can override any of that stuff. But if you need absolute max performance, you're probably going to hand code your stuff. So setup steps. There's two jars that you need. There's Storm API, which uh, contains the annotations themselves, as well as the runtime for the framework. And then there's Storm APT, which is your actual annotation processor. So anybody actually written a Java annotation processor before? Yeah. It's fun. <laughs> it's really, uh, it really is fun. Uh, the coolest thing about it is that you can make red squigglies appear in Eclipse. Right? So if there's problems uh, that you detect as you're processing the source code, then you can just log those to the annotation processor, and it puts up a red squiggly in Eclipse. I think it's really cool to be able to do that. It's actually really useful, too, as you'll see here uh, when we get going a little bit. So let me just show you what this looks like. I've got a little sample project going here, uh, Storm Demo. And I will just show you that I have on the build path, I actually have not the jar, but the whole project, since it's on my uh, machine here. But you could just add the jar. And then the important thing is you need to go into this Order and Export tab and check to export that API jar as well. Otherwise, uh, the Android won't be able to find it when you try to run tests on it. So that's that set up. And then the other thing we have under the Java compiler, we have annotation processing enabled. That's just checking this box up here. And then on our factory path, we have storm apt.jar. So this is a feature that's been in Java for a while now uh, that basically it's, it's just going to inspect our source code uh, anytime we save changes and run our annotation processor. It'll look for specific annotations, and then it can generate code in response to those annotations. So that's my project setup. OK, so let's, let's actually use this thing. Uh, first, we have to have a database. So to do that, we just extend a database helper class. And let me show you how this goes. We'll create another database here by just creating a class. We'll call it demo2 database helper. 
and it has to extend a framework class here, database helper. And this is basically just a wrapper for your SQLite open helper that you would do uh, anyway. Let me zoom this out here. So it gives you the, the required constructor by default, and that's fine. That's all you need. And then you need to choose an upgrade strategy, which there are three of them. There's drop, create, backup, restore, and upgrade. We'll talk about those in a, in a minute. But for a new database, you'd probably just do drop, create, which, as the name implies, is just going to drop the tables and create them fresh. Uh, so it's, it's decent when you're developing a brand new app. OK, so that was easy enough. And then we just annotate this class with the database annotation. Yay for red squigglies. Uh, oh, no. What happened? Maybe I've got. OK, let me save it first and then see if I can get control one to work. No, something is wrong. Very annoying. All right, well, anyway, we have two attributes we have to require or uh, supply. Oh, yeah, I'm trying to put it in the wrong place. Thank you. Uh, that was interesting. All right, let's see if we can find that. There we go. Import it. And then we should add the missing attributes. Yes, thank you. So we give it a name, uh, demo2db. We give it a version number and save it. OK, and you've seen the error log, which is a useful view to keep up when you're working with an annotation processor. Uh, you can see we had a template error. I think that was before. And then now we're generating com.turbomanage.demo.db, demo 2 db factory. And we'll talk about those classes uh, in just a second. So now we have a database. But actually, I don't want uh, this database. I want the other one that I have as part of this project already. So I'm going to delete that, but I just wanted to show you how to do it. One thing when you're using an annotation processor and you delete something that has generated code, is that you're going to frequently have to go clean the project to get rid of the artifacts. Right? So now we're back to where we were. And I'll show you my other database helper class. Um, OK, so now we need an entity. So let me create a new um, entity. Let's call it user group. And we'll just go with that for now. So this is my plain old Java object. Uh, we'll give it some fields. It needs an ID. And by convention here so far, this is what it is. It's every object just needs a long ID. And then it also probably needs a name. So we'll do private string group name. And let's just. Do a private date, meeting time, or something like this. And we want Java util date. OK, let's generate our required getters and setters. And that's our class. Now to generate the, data, the, the magic for this, I just need to annotate it with at entity. And here the red squigglies come into play, because it turns out I also need to implement an interface uh, called persistible. And this is up for debate right now. We're on the team. There's some people who don't want that. We'd, we'd like it so you don't have to implement or extend anything. Persistable just has a couple of methods, uh, get ID and set ID. So those are used by the current uh, framework. But that's all there is to it. So basic class, we got a few fields. Uh, we're done with that part. 
Okay, so this has generated some code for us. We're going to take a look at that now. Under the apt generated folder, which you may have to unfilter resources to see this uh, in Eclipse if you're using that, we have the database factory class, which tells you it's generated code, right? And it just has uh, the static DB name and DB version coded in there that we supplied in the annotation. Uh, it's got a list of table helper classes, which are the ones that are going to hold all the SQL for each table. And it's got user group table in here twice, probably because there's a bug. Um, so I can clean my project and get rid of that. Let me just do that. Let's have a look at that again here. OK, now there's only two tables in there. Uh, so this just implements a singleton pattern for getting the database helper, which is your actual uh, SQLite open helper that's part of Android. Uh, so if it doesn't exist, then it just creates a new instance. And of course, you have to pass it a valid context, uh, because that's required by the SQLite open helper. So that's that. There's really not much to this class. It's just um, a factory class that needs to be there because you need something hard-coded uh, that it can pull from when you do a, the SQLite open helper call to supply the name and version, et cetera. OK, so we also have now for our each object, person and user group are the two that we've modeled, we have a DAO and a table class. So let's look at uh, let's look at user group DAO since that was our the one we did on screen here. So this is just a thin little uh, wrapper class. It extends SQLite DAO, which is a generified base DAO, and this is where all the good stuff lives. If we take a look at that guy, uh, you'll see that's where all the fun methods are: delete, get, list, insert, etc. Uh, but here, basically, all we have to do is provide a reference to the appropriate factory. So an entity is associated with a database, and uh, we need to know which one. The idea of multiple databases is in here, although it's not fully supported yet. And then we need the table helper class where we can get all of our SQL uh, statements. So that's really all this guy does. Okay, and then we have a table class, and this is where all the heavy lifting happens right here. So at the top, we have an enum representing the columns. And the convention right now is just that the, the column name is all caps, the field name, except for ID. It has an underscore, because that's the Android uh, SQLite convention. Uh, we get the table name. We have our create SQL statement, our drop SQL. Upgrade is currently null. Uh, but if you want to put in a cust custom upgrade statement, you could do that by extending this class. Uh, and then we have several methods that allow us to convert uh, to and from objects. And this is the kind of code that you have to write by hand um, otherwise. So let's take a look at new instance, for example. This, given a cursor, uh, we're just going to pull one row off the cursor and create an instance of our user group object by calling it setters. And so we get, we get the string from the cursor. Uh, we run it through a converter, the string converter, which just returns the string. Uh, and then we call the setter. And we do that for each field. And going the other direction, we can take our user group object, we can call the various getters, run them through a converter, and then use those values to populate a content values object. And so this is pretty lightweight. There's not a lot of stuff uh, going on here. It's all stuff you're going to have to write by hand anyway. And there's a bunch of other methods related to different types of conversions, like uh, you can get an array of strings that represent the column values, um, which is useful for other things. We'll talk about that in a second. So that's basically it. You get those generated classes. And then to use it, uh, you just create a new instance of the entity DAO, pass it your context, and then you can call the methods on it. So let's take a look at a test case, which does a little bit of this. 
Okay, so we create a new person DAO, pass it our context. Uh, this would be your application context if you were in an activity. Here it's just the, the test instrumentation context. Uh, we call DAO.insert, we give it our object, we get back the ID of the newly inserted object. Uh, then we can call DAO.get, give it the ID, we should get the person back. The ID should be the same. Uh, this is just a little demo line here, not really needed. There's lots of methods available on our DAO now. We can do like list all and get all the objects that are in the table. Uh, we can do delete, delete all, update. We can do insert many and give it uh, a whole collection of our objects and it will do an efficient uh, insert there. So there's lot, lots of stuff that's available. Let me point out a few of those things on this, this other slide here. Oops, there went my power. Shouldn't need it for a while. Uh, so you can see some of the, the most useful API methods. The insert, insert mini, uh, get will just return a single object. Uh, update, delete, list all will convert it all to a list. And then there's several example methods like list by example, get by example, where you can pass it um, a pop, an example object where you, po you populate only the fields that you're interested in and it will include them then as part of the query, the query for that object. And the way this works is it actually creates a new instance of the object and then compares your example object with the new instance and anything that's different than the default values it uses in the query. And then there's also a little convenient filter method uh, which lets you right now just do add conditions that are equality conditions. So you can say dao.filter.equals, give it the column name, the value, uh, et cetera. And then exec the filter. So by convention, again, the, the column name is just the field name in uppercase, and ID is required, it's a long, and the column name is underscore ID, and there's currently no way, no way to change that. So the types that are currently supported, uh, you can have any primitive and wrapper type, the little b, boolean byte, et cetera, as well as the big B, uh, and string, and then byte arrays are treated as blobs. Uh, boolean, byte, and char all have integer affinity in SQLite uh, so that they can, uh, you can use them different ways. It seemed like the best way to do it, but you could write your own converter and change that if you wanted to. There's also a type converter interface uh, with a Java type and a SQL type. And if you want to write your own converter for your own data type, you can do that. Uh, you just have to extend type converter and then annotate it with at converter and do a project clean because I don't yet have the inc support for at converter in uh, incremental compilation. So some little niceties here, there are a couple of public methods as list. Uh, you pass it a cursor, it gets you back the list of the objects. There's also an as object that will expect to find one row and one row in the cursor only. Uh, this is used like by the get method. And if there's more than one in the cursor, it'll throw a too many results exception. So you'll be notified that, hey, the cursor returned more than you were expecting. The insert mini method uses the database utils.insert helper class to prepare the statement only once and then run all the inserts inside a single transaction, uh, which is uh, much better performance than doing each one individually. The column name enum, enum can be useful, like the filter method uh, gives you some type safety around your columns as opposed to just putting string field names in there. And then, of course, red squigglies are kind of cool. So one of the challenges is for upgrading your database versions, and there's currently uh, three strategies supported for that. The drop create is uh, the easiest, but of course uh, you lose your data. <laughs> so that's not ideal if you've got a production app. Uh, so the other one that's kind of automatic is the backup restore strategy, which uses CSV files. 
So it will actually dump the contents of the current database to a CSV file, and then it will read that CSV file into your new schema, and any columns that have been I think I have a slide on this, actually. So let me just say a couple more words about the CSV methods here. Uh, you can call these methods directly from the database helper, which you can get from the DAO or the database factory. Uh, the database helper has the methods back up all tables and restore from CSV. Um, one thing that it does is it tries to preserve your data exactly, which is a little bit tricky with things like doubles. Uh, so it actually calls the double to raw long bits uh, method to get the raw uh, value and then saves it as a hex encoded value in your CSV file. So you wouldn't be able to read the CSV file with just any CSV reader and get a meaningful value out of that double, but it does preserve the exact value so that you'll reload your database correctly. Uh, and then also blobs are base64 encoded so that they can be uh, safely stored in a CSV. So there's a file name, the DB name dot V, whatever your version number is, dot table name. You'll see a bunch of those files in your, if you look in your apps files uh, when you use this method. So to do this automatically, all you have to do is set your upgrade strategy to backup restore. And then any columns that you've dropped between versions will disappear. Uh, any ones that you've added will get the default values from the object. And if you've renamed any, um, sorry about that, it's not supported yet. <laughs> but we'll be adding probably a column name annotation or something like that so that you can add that at the time you rename a field and then pull that out of the uh, database. And you could also do it by, instead of using the backup restore strategy, you could use a custom upgrade strategy. And you could manually edit the CSV file and change the column names if you wanted to, I guess, so that they'd be read back into the appropriate fields. But we'll, we'll have support for renaming eventually, soon probably. Uh, so the last strategy is just upgrade. And to do this, you can override the database helper dot upgrade method uh, in your database helper class and do whatever you want in there in terms of migrating the SQL. Uh, or you can just uh, override the on upgrade method for each table individually if you want to uh, in the table helpers. And that will let you, uh, you know, do any, rebuild any indexes, add alter table statements, or however you want to do your upgrade. Okay, so a couple limits. Yeah, no relational modeling yet. Um, also, you can't currently compare doubles or blobs if you're using the filter builder uh, API because it's hard to compare exact values of doubles. It's generally a way to get into trouble. Uh, so we'll probably be adding a, like a, a delta method that lets you su supply a range of how close it has to be to be an exact match. And blobs, I don't think we'll ever allow, I mean, if somebody wants to add it, that's fine, compare blobs, but you have to base 64 encode them and it gets kind of messy. That would be inefficient. You can always write your own custom queries if you want to do these things by using the dao.query. So I already talked about what these different classes were, the database factory, the DAO, and the table helper. Uh, this one maybe shows graphically how the main function of the table helper, that it contains all the SQL, uh, all your cursor get and your, uh, sorry, your cursor, yeah, cursor get and your um, helper bind methods, converts from a cursor to an object to content values as needed. That's what that's for. So the idea was to construct this so that the, the actual uh, SQLite interactions happens in that base DAO class uh, that's available for everybody, uh, for all your tables. And any, the only stuff that's in the generated code is the actual, how do I get an object from a cursor, et cetera. Uh, so the base SQLite class is not generated, and that allows us to do better testing and debugging of that class. 
So just a few notes on the uh, implementation here. One of the challenges was supporting incremental compilation because it turns out that annotation processing happens in rounds. And when you write an annotation processor, you actually get uh, passed to you what's called a round environment, which is only the code that uh, it's looking at during that round. Uh, and the idea here is that if you generate code, it, that generated code might have annotations which generate other code. So the first round generates some code, and then the second round looks at that additional code, et cetera. Now, Storm isn't that complicated. It just essentially it just needs one round. Um, but unfortunately, because of this architecture of APT, you can only see the code that was changed uh, during, a given, um, during a given save. So if you go in and add an entity annotation, the only thing that your annotation processor is going to see is that entity and the source code that's related to that entity. It does not see the entire source tree, right? So since we're generating a database helper or a database factory class, which has to know about all the available entities, uh, and since each entity has to know about any available databases, then we had, I needed some way to keep track of what had already been processed in previous rounds, right? So I used a file, which is about the only way to do it. Uh, so you'll actually see in your Eclipse, uh, if you look at it, under the APT generated with all your generated code, there's also this file called stormenv. And it's just a simple little text file with the information about the database and each uh, entity in there. Actually, just the names of the table helper classes, which is really all that's needed uh, for that stage. So if you're having uh, problems with this in this preview phase, you know, project clean will rebuild this file, because when you do a project clean, then all the source code is available and all the annotations are available in the project. So that's really how your, your processor is going to work uh, the best ordinarily. OK, but by, by reading in this file, before each round of annotation processing, it does support incremental compilation. So you can go in and just add one new at entity, and it works. Uh, the only thing that doesn't work yet is the at converter. Uh, this uses FreeMarker to do the code generation. So let me show you a little bit of those templates. Here's uh, databasefactory.ftl. Um, it's, it's really pretty straightforward. It's just, you can see though, you know, it's a lot less fun to work with Java code in a free marker template than it is in uh, the Java editors because you don't get all the completion and syntax highlighting and stuff like that. So that's another reason why I tried to minimize the amount of Java code in the, that's actually generated from the templates. And these you will find in the impl project if you check out the source under the source uh, res directory. Just three templates, entity DAO, uh, table helper template is probably the most interesting. It's pretty big. Um, but it actually doesn't take a whole lot of code to generate these various classes. And then the error log view, just a reminder that that, that has a few uh, debugging notes that go in there as the annotation processor runs so you can confirm that files are going to the right place, things like that. OK, so what does the future hold for this thing? Uh, limited, limited support for relations. Uh, we at least want to be able to do a primary foreign key relationship uh, so that when you do a get, you could maybe pass a flag that would say, you know, also populate relations. And it would then do a second query uh, or a join to go grab the related object and pull that in as well. Um, I'm, not, I'm not inclined to go with uh, lazy loading or proxy loading or anything like that like Hibernate does because that gets to be really uh, messy uh, and trying to keep it lightweight. Um, more filter methods, we need greater than, less than, you know, all the standard uh, SQL comparisons between, et cetera. The filter builder API currently, in order to properly uh, throw an exception if you try to do an EQ on a double or a blob. 
um, I had to create an overloaded uh, method for each equals method. So you have an equals that takes a double, float, long, short, et cetera. Uh, and it's kind of a pain to have to do that for all of them, but actually there is a little bit of value in that in terms of um, getting it exactly right, right? Uh, so probably there will be an at ID annotation at some point where you can change your ID column. It doesn't have to be the ID field. And a column name uh, annotation of some kind. And then there's a lot of interest in this right now um, within the Android tooling uh, guys, uh, Xavier and uh, Tor. So we're looking at putting in hooks so that this could be a standard uh, library as part of the ADT. You can find the source here at drfibonacci.googlecode.com. I put in, uh, I actually already published the slides. There's a link right at the top of the page here, and there's the simple little basic usage thing, but really there's more info on the slides at this point. Uh, you can get to all the source. Uh, it's in Git. Uh, use the issue tracker if you want. It's probably going to get moved at some point pretty soon because uh, in order to support making it part of the ADT. Okay, so last year we did a blog post uh, on the official Android blog um, about making HTTP calls from native apps. And it used to be Apache HTTP client was the recommendation because it's part of the uh, OS. And it's very full featured, well tested over a long period of time, huge, huge surface area for, for features in that client. Uh, so unfortunately, that huge feature set means there's a huge support surface for it as well. And uh, I think the desire of the Android team was to scale back the minimally supported capabilities. Uh, so they started recommending HTTP URL connection instead. Uh, but that, as you know, is a much lower level API. So uh, with HTTP client, you're just saying, you know, new git method and, uh, and then executing it. With HTTP URL connection, you're reading and writing streams. Right? So it's a lot lower level. So I felt there was a need uh, for a project to just have, again, a simple HTTP interface. Um, that would have, that would be more similar to HTTP client as far as its overall approach, uh, but would correctly handle all the I/O streams and reading the error stream and the try close finally, try close in the finally, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so, there's a couple clients uh, that are available beside that you might want to look at. There's the Google HTTP Java client, which is an open source project on Google Code, um, that's actually used by the Google API Java client. Uh, which is a project that you can use to have wrappers for any REST API that's part of our standard apiary infrastructure. Uh, then, then I also wrote a basic HTTP client, which is a really thin one. It's just a simple, very simple client. That doesn't try to support the, the huge feature set of Apache. Um, but the, the kind of the target space is, well, I just need a little stuff from the web. Uh, we wanted to make that, that easier. So that's what it is. Uh, so there's a synchronous and an async API. And the, the thing that's kind of novel about basic HTTP client is that it provides an async callback uh, method so that, that will automatically wrap your request in an async task because you don't want to execute network requests on the UI thread. Right? That's a big no-no. Uh, so ordinarily, you want to either do it in an async task or best is actually in a service. Uh, and I don't have support for that yet. But it's open to patches. <laughs> Somebody wants to write that. It, it actually won't be very difficult. Um, so there's an async API, which is really easy to use. Uh, and then it's extensible as well. You can supply your own request logger and request handler if you need to change um, how you open a connection, for example, supply custom SSL properties or something like that. Then you can really easily um, su supply your own sauce for that. So the source is here, and the how-to page is actually here as well. So let me uh, pop that up here. Uh, 
you can see the API. Hopefully, that's readable. Basically, uh, I can show you even a simpler example, actually, in the bigger print. Uh, let me just close all these guys and pull up the basic HTTP client tests. OK, so the very simplest case. Now, this actually is not Android specific. Uh, it's intended to be for any Java app. Uh, so the basic HTTP client is the non-Android aware uh, version. And you just initiate it, give it a site, and then call your client.get, client.post, client.head, client. whatever the HTTP methods are, right? And it just does those things. And you get back a response object, and then you can check the status code. You can call get body to get the body of the response. So it's very straightforward, right? Uh, these two parameters out here that are null, null, this is the path that will be appended to the base path that you set up with part of your client. So a common thing is to initiate uh, a client to a site, but then you have different requests to different paths on the site. And then null, the second null is a parameters object uh, that you can pass with all your request parameters. And it'll do the right thing. You pass it a map, and if it's a get request, it URL encodes them and puts them on the query string. And if it's a post request, it makes them the uh, MIME type form data uh, encoding and all that. And then this is an example of the async API here. Uh, here we're using the Android HTTP client, which extends the async uh, class. And it also has a couple Android aware um, little workarounds from prior bugs on prior operating system versions. Um, so we do a get, uh, but the third argument is an async callback object. And then this code will actually uh, complete whenever the request comes back. So what that does is actually creates an async task wrapper, executes your, your uh, request there, and then calls you back when it's done. Now, this test won't actually uh, test anything because I was just illustrating the call of the API. Um, but it, J unit, I'd have to wait and wait for a flag and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but that's, that's what the async API looks like. If you want to get a little fancier and pass uh, a custom handler, you can do that. So in the example here, uh, we just want to override our error handler. So when we create the client, we can pass the additional argument, which is a request handler type. And the easiest thing to do is just extend your basic request handler that's part of the framework already, and then override the one method that you want to you know, change, the error handler. So it's very easy to change. Also, if you do async, I think I was going to mention that. Uh, when you use the async mechanism, then it automatically will do retry and back off, uh, exponential back off as well. And the retries, uh, you can set max retries and that sort of thing. Uh, it tries to be intelligent about whether it's a fatal exception or whether it's a recoverable exception. Um, and there's actually a method that you can override in the request handler to determine that logic for yourself as well, whether you want to recover from a, any given exception. Um, so the source is at basichttpclient.googlecode.com. And some final resources that you might want to look at. Uh, of course, you've all seen developerandroid.com. There's a little page not many people know about that uh, the Android, some of the guys on my team don't like me sharing this page because it's a little bit out of date. However, it's fantastic. If you've never seen this page, you should go there. <laughs> Common Tasks is an Android. You can search for it in the, on the developer site. And it's just like if you're just starting Android development, this page will save your life. It's, it's uh, oh, sorry, take that back. Legal doesn't like it when I say things like that. All right. <laughs> uh, but no, it's a great resource because it's just how to do all the common things. How do I put up a menu? How do I you know, do a context menu, whatever? Uh, 
I wish I'd had this page when I started. It would have saved a lot of time on other sites learning some of this stuff. Is it better than Stack Overflow? <laughs> uh, actually, as far as just a one stop, you know, for for beginning tasks, I think it is better than Stack Overflow. Yes, um, but. Thank you for mentioning Stack Overflow because we do officially support that. We have a lot of uh, a lot of our team will answer questions on Stack Overflow, and uh, it is a great resource for for getting you know how does any particular X thing work on Android. There's my blog. I do a few things. Uh, be sure to connect with Android developers on Google Plus. Uh, we do weekly, several weekly hangouts around the world on Android development topics. Um, there's a dory that you can submit questions in advance. We'll research them and then answer live on the hangout. Uh, there's uh, app reviews that we do every week saying these are what we like in apps. This is good UI design. This is ways to improve. Um, so there's, we're, there's a lot of stuff that we're doing right now. Uh, we want to encourage people to connect with us. And then I do an Android blog post every couple of weeks or so now when I work on these frameworks. And I'm sure you'll see more as I add features to, to uh, the ones that I talked about. I appreciate you coming over. Yeah, you're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you.